Okay, so the topic of today's video is passive transport. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so passive transport is the movement of molecules across a membrane without the use of energy, energy in the form of ATP. Now, during passive transport, molecules are moved from a high concentration to an area of low concentration. Now look at the picture. We can see on the left side of the box, the yellow dots are more highly concentrated, and on the right side, there's a lower concentration of these yellow dots. So over time, if these yellow dots represent molecules, over time, the molecules will move mostly from the left to the right until there's an even balance, and we call this balance equilibrium. Now, when we say they move from a high to low concentration, we can also say they move down their concentration gradient. These two phrases mean the same thing, from high to low concentration and down their concentration gradient. But a concentration gradient is really the difference of a substance between one location and another. So in my uh, picture here, I have a scenario here, here. Scenario A, on the left there's eight dots and on the right there's only two. Scenario B, there are six dots on the left and four dots on the right. So my question is, which scenario, A or B, shows a greater concentration gradient? Well, in both cases, the molecules are going to uh, move really from the left to the right. It's going to take four of the yellow dots to move to the right in order to get to equilibrium. But in scenario B, only one has to move to the right to get to equilibrium. So the answer of my question is scenario A has a greater concentration gradient. There's a difference of six and there's a difference of two for scenario B. So again, the answer is scenario A has a greater concentration gradient compared to uh, scenario B. So I hope that helps identify what a concentration gradient is. Now, examples of passive transport include diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated the diffusion. That's what the rest of this video is going to focus on, and they all have something in common. If you follow the picture, there's a high concentration on the top of the membrane and a low concentration on the bottom. So over time, the, the, the blue hexagon molecules will move until there's an equal balance of them. This is what passive transport is. So let's talk about diffusion first, the movement of dissolved molecules in a fluid or in a gas from an area of high to low concentration. Well, here's a cell, and the cell has some oxygen in it and around it. Now, will the oxygen mostly enter or exit the cell? Well, I hope you realize most of the oxygen is going to enter from a high concentration to an area of lower concentration. Some of the oxygen actually might leave and exit the cell, but the vast majority will enter until there's this balance known as equilibrium. And this is how cells obtain their needed molecules. Let's pretend these black circles represent something that the cell needs, like a nutrient. Well, they're diffusing from a high concentration on the outside to a low concentration on the inside. Diffusion is also how cells get rid of unwanted waste. Like perhaps these black circles represent a waste, and notice how they're diffusing from an area of high to low concentration. You know, diffusion also explains how a fart will travel across a room. Look at the student in the top right. Oh, he just let out a fart. So right now there's a high concentration of fart molecules around this student, but over time they will diffuse to a lower concentrated area, which is all throughout the classroom. And eventually other students begin to notice it as it diffuses and they can then smell it. And so eventually diffusion continues and then there's a balance that's reached, an equilibrium. This is where there's an even balance of molecules. And in my picture here, in which area, A, B, or C, can we see equilibrium? I hope you realize that's picture C. Well, when we look at diffusion, we can really look at how we breathe and understand how diffusion plays a role in this process. So imagine this, uh, this woman here, she inhales a breath of O2, oxygen. Well, if we follow that oxygen, we're gonna see that diffusion plays an important role. So as we follow the oxygen, the oxygen is going to spread into the woman's lungs, you know, down her trachea, through the left and right bronchi, and into the woman's lungs. And 
In our lungs, there are these little air sacs called alveoli, millions of them in each lung that fill up with oxygen. So here's one of those air sacs. And so oxygen will fill the millions of air sacs, the alveoli that are in each lung. Now ask yourself, where is the high oxygen concentration right now? I hope you see it's in the alveoli. Where is the low oxygen concentration? It's in the little tiny blood vessel called capillaries that are just on the outside of the alveoli. So oxygen will diffuse into the capillaries. And then because your heart's beating, your heart will pump this oxygen rich blood all around the body. Let's go follow this oxygen. And here's some of the oxygen that just diffused and it's traveling through our bloodstream. And now notice the cell at the bottom, cell X. Cell X, like every other cell, needs oxygen, but it's not in direct contact with the blood. So how does cell X get oxygen? Well, ask yourself, where is the high and low oxygen concentrations? I hope you see the high concentrations in the blood flow, and the low concentration is in all the cells surrounding the blood, even cell X. So through diffusion, oxygen begins to diffuse from a high concentrated area to a low concentrated area, and cell X can get its oxygen, just like all the other cells in the body. But you know, the reverse process is true with carbon dioxide. Over time, your cells will generate carbon dioxide waste, and too much can become fatal, so it's got to get removed. Look what's happening. These cells have generated carbon dioxide waste. How do we get rid of it? Well, ask yourself, where is the high carbon dioxide and where is the low carbon dioxide concentrations? Well, the high concentration is in the cells. The low concentration is in the bloodstream. So carbon dioxide will diffuse into the bloodstream and your heart is continually pumping this blood. In this case, the carbon dioxide is gonna go back to the lungs. And here comes the carbon dioxide back to the alveoli, the lungs, those air sacs that are in our lungs. And if I were to ask you, where is the high carbon dioxide concentration? I hope you realize it's in the capillaries. Where is the low CO2 concentration? It's in the alveoli. So once again, diffusion will occur and the carbon dioxide diffuses into the alveoli. So we can exhale it and get the carbon dioxide out of our system. And so as the woman exhales, the carbon dioxide is pushed up her trachea, and eventually out her nose and mouth. We have a muscle underneath our lungs called the diaphragm that helps to uh, aid in this exhaling process. And the carbon dioxide is expelled into the, uh, into the atmosphere. And this process repeats with every breath. She inhales oxygen. A moment later, she exhales carbon dioxide. She inhales oxygen. And a moment later, she exhales carbon dioxide, but diffusion plays an important role in the journey of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Well, if we shift focus and talk about osmosis, osmosis is the diffusion of water, specifically water, from a high to low concentration. And so let's talk about uh, a certain type of water. Maybe you've heard of what's called distilled water. Well, here's a distiller right here. This is how you make distilled water. You can take some water and you can boil it and the heat will turn the water into a steam. The steam rises and it eventually cools and condenses. And the water that's collected at the end is pure water. It's distilled water or pure water. Any contaminants and impurities have been left behind in the original boiling container. So distilled water is 100% pure water. So here's a container of distilled water. It's 100% pure water, which means there's no solutes in it. So distilled water is again 100% pure water. It's got no solutes in it. Now imagine if I place a cell into distilled water. The cell has, in this example, 90% water, 10% solutes. My question is, if only water molecules can pass in and out of the cell, what's gonna happen to the cell over time. Well, I hope you see that through osmosis, water will go from a high concentration of 100% to a lower concentration of 90%. Water will diffuse into the cell and it will probably eventually swell. And so what we have here 
The water inside of the cell is an example of a hypertonic solution. A hypertonic solution is one that has a greater amount of solutes. Now there's only 10% solutes, but that 10% is greater than the 0% on the outside. And so the solution on the outside is called a hypotonic environment, a hypotonic solution. This is a solution with a lower amount of solutes. So you have to compare the two. Compare the solution in the beaker to the solution in the cell. Let's do another example using salt water. Now, here's a container, pretend, of salt water. And salt water has a high amount of solutes in it, namely salt. Let's pretend this salt water is 80% water, 20% solutes. Let's bring back that same cell from a moment ago. The cell has 90% water, 10% solutes. My question is, what's, if only water can pass in and out of the cell, what's going to happen to the cell over time? Through osmosis, the cell is going to lose water from a high concentration of 90% to a low concentration of 80%. It'll probably start to shrink and shrivel as it loses water. Now, the water inside of the beaker in this example is hypertonic. It has a greater amount of solutes. 20% is a greater amount of solutes than 10%. And the solution inside of the cell in this example would be hypotonic. Notice it's reversed from the previous example. Now here's some practice. Here's a beaker filled with 70% water, 30% solute. If we put two cells in the water, I want you to try to answer these questions right here. Pause the video. I'm going to go over the answers in three, two, one. So if only water can pass in and out of the cells, which of these two cells is going to swell? Well, I hope you realize water is going to go into cell A because of osmosis, and water is going to come out of cell B because of osmosis. So which cell is going to swell? That's going to be cell A because water is going into it. Now, relative to the environment, which cell is filled with a hypotonic environment? Hypertonic means it has greater amounts of solutes. So cell A is hypertonic compared to the environment of hypotonic. But now look at cell B. Cell B's environment is hypertonic and inside is hypotonic. Hypotonic is the environment with uh, fewer solutes. 20% is fewer solutes than 30% environment. So I hope you said cell B. Here's another practice problem right here. Here's ours, our container of water with three cells in it. Pause the video, try to answer these questions. I'm going to go over the answers in three, two, one. So if only water molecules can pass in and out of this cell, number one, what do all three cells have in common? I hope you realize there's a few ways you can answer this, but all three cells are filled with a hypertonic solution. In other words, they're all going to gain water. Water is going to go into all of these cells because of osmosis. They're all going to swell. Question number two, relative to the environment, which cell has the steepest or the greatest concentration gradient? I hope you identified cell C. There's a bigger difference between the environment of the beaker and the environment of cell C. And then for number three, which cell is going to reach equilibrium the fastest? That's going to be cell A because it's closer to equilibrium already. It's not exactly at equilibrium, but it's closer to equilibrium. So it should reach equilibrium the fastest. Okay, and then the final topic is facilitated diffusion. Now the word facilitate simply means to help. So sometimes diffusion needs help. And in facilitated diffusion, molecules can enter and exit a cell with the help of various protein channels that can be found within the cell membrane. Well, carbon dioxide is a really small molecule. It doesn't need help. It can just slip right through the cell membrane. Same thing for oxygen. It's a real small molecule. It doesn't need help. It can just slip right through the cell membrane. So what are some examples of molecules that need help? Well, one would be larger molecules, like glucose. Glucose is made up of 24 atoms, 6 carbon, 12 hydrogens, and 6 oxygens. It's a bigger molecule. It's just too big to slip right through the cell membrane. But what will happen is it will, glucose can travel through these protein channels 
to go from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. So with help, the molecules can still diffuse into the cells. Other examples that need help are charged ions or charged molecules. So the example right here is potassium. Potassium is really small. It's only one atom in size. It's small enough to fit through the cell membrane, but because it has a positive charge and because the cell membrane also has a charge, the cell membrane kind of repels the potassium. So it can't just go right through the cell membrane. But the potassium can also use different protein channels than the ones that glucose was using. So through the cell membrane are these little protein channels that molecules and ions can enter and exit. And because this is facilitated diffusion, no energy or ATP is used. There you go. I hope you found this video helpful. Try this practice quiz. If you're in my class, I'm happy to check your answers before class or after class one day. Thanks for watching.